welcome and uh, say hi in the chat box if you're there. Uh, I just want to say once again, Merry Christmas plus one. So if you're keeping count, it's only 364 more days till Christmas 2022. All right, so I hope you had a special day with your family as we did with ours. We had a great time. Uh, always enjoy Christmas and the reason for the season and what it means. So now, as you may uh, know, as you now know, uh, we had a sudden change this week in our Wednesday uh, leading up to this Sunday. We had to make a decision uh, because of the widespread uh, um, <laughs> uh, Omicron variant that's uh, that's taken place. So we had a sudden change, and we're back at church in the kitchen. Now, unlike last year, this is voluntary on our part. It wasn't mandatory by the community center. So what caused the sudden change was due to a few factors. And first of all, the Omicron variant had spiked in our community. It was like a uh, tidal wave. And secondly, people in our church who had absolutely no symptoms last Sunday, not a cold, fever, fatigue, suddenly became symptomatic. And even and the only one we're going to mention is our uh, daughter, Chrissy, uh, who flew in. Uh, she had no symptoms on Sunday. She actually tested because she had been flying a few days earlier. And um, she tested negative on Sunday, but by Wednesday she had a cough, and Thursday she tested positive. And then we started getting reports of other people who had also tested positive who were like uh, Chrissy with no symptoms before. And so that caused us to make the decision so that nobody else would be at risk at our church. Now, fortunately, Everyone that we had monitored so far has had mild symptoms, stuffy nose, low-grade fever, slight headache. Many seem to be on the other side already, which is good news. Now, however, we have many high-risk people that we want to make sure and protect so that we have taken the precautions to go ahead and cancel service not only this Sunday today, but next Sunday, January 2nd, we'll also have church in the kitchen. So if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, first of all, please uh, consult your physician, but also let us know so that we can be praying for you and help you in any way that we can. So uh, just wanted to let you know what our thinking was behind this, why we decided so... Uh, quickly to uh, go back to church in the kitchen this week and that's because of the Omicron variant that is just really kind of spiked as you well know within the community. So let's go ahead we're going to open up with a word of prayer and uh, going to go into today's message the law of change. Let's pray together. Father God Lord we bless you we thank you for this day. Lord Father we thank you that this is the day that you have made we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be able to gather together where you said that two or three are gathered in your name, that you are here in the midst with us. And so, Lord, I pray for each and every person, each and every household that is represented today, those who have uh, joined in, who will be joining in. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will minister to the hearts and the lives of those who are here today, Father, to hear your word. Father, we invite your Holy Spirit to come and to speak to us and to prepare our hearts for this new year, 2022. We're only a week away. It's amazing to me how fast this year has gone by. But Father, we bless you. We thank you. Father, we entrust this service to you and ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can you believe it? We're only a week away from the new year, a new start, a new beginning. So how will this new year be better, be more dynamic, more productive than last year? What has to change? And that's the message of my message today, the law of change. And I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about, first of all, change. But secondly, 
that change that puts us in charge. And so the first thing that I want to talk about is to make a new change. If you're taking notes, it, to make a new change, it starts with a small step. Zechariah 4.10 tells us, do not despise the day of small things. Big changes start with small steps in our lives. Mark Twain once observed famously, he said, everybody talks about the weather, but nobody does anything about it. And on the same note, everybody talks about change, but few people know how to do it. So you are either growing and changing or you're stagnant and dying. If I was the same pastor today that I was 20 years ago, uh, when we got ready to start church in the glades, I don't believe that we'd have a church today. You see, I had to grow. I had to change. I had to develop. I had to mature. I had to do all of those things. You don't get to a place where you just arrive and you just coast from there. We're always growing, always changing. If I was the same husband that I was 34 years ago when me and April got married, hey, we may not be married today. And I'm not just being facetious or lighthearted about that. Uh, I had to grow, change, mature. We all have to develop. And if we get stuck in our old, old ways, if we get stuck in the stinking thinking of our past, you know, some people will say that this is the way I am, take it or leave it. And we kind of get stuck, we get rigid, and that is going to impact every aspect of our life. And to be honest with you, that I could be a jerk sometimes uh, in my life and my relationship, and I've had to grow and mature past those things. You see, God is always trying to change and develop us. You know, when you think about the Gospels, when you think about Peter, James, and John, and you read through the Gospels, what you find is a moment encapsulated in time. We read about Peter's beginnings with the Lord, the first couple of years, and the things that he thought about himself, the pride that he had in his heart, uh, the growing pains as a new believer. You remember the time when Jesus told all of his disciples, hey, I am going to be handed over to the authorities. I'm going to be crucified. On the third day, I'm going to be raised. And of course, Peter who always jumped ahead, who was always leaving. He had a lot of energy. He had a lot of emotion. He had a lot of zeal. And he told Jesus because he honestly, genuinely thought in his heart that he was just about a cut above uh, the other disciples. And he kind of said so. He said, Lord, if all others desert you, if all others leave you, I will stand with you. I'll go to prison with you, and I will even die with you. And Jesus looked at Peter and he was sincere in his heart, but he said, Peter, before tonight is over, you are going to deny three times that you even know me. Can you imagine that? Not two days later, not two weeks later, but just in a few hours, you are going to deny three times. Before the rooster crows twice, you are going to deny three times that you even know me. And that was the same with the disciples, James and John. You know, these guys thought that they would be one of the greatest of all the disciples. And they told Jesus they wanted to sit on his left and on his right. So they were all encapsulated in this moment of time, and they had to change. The Peter that we read about in the Gospels is not the same Peter that we read about in the book of Acts, or 1 Peter, 2 Peter. Same person, same DNA, but we read in Acts about how he matured and grew. We read from his writings. Can you imagine that Peter would be walking down the street, the anointing and the power and the maturity was so heavy upon him that people would lay people in the streets so that Peter's shadow could pass by that uh, it might overshadow some of the people. That was the power and the anointing of Peter in the book of Acts and into the future, but that was not the Peter of the Gospels. And the same thing with James uh, and John. 
John, who wrote the uh, book of Revelation on the island of Patmos in his latter days, the anointing and the power that was on him. But you see the immaturity in the Gospels. And the idea is that we all have to grow. We all have to change. The biggest challenge for most Christians who have been saved for any length of time is that they stop wanting to change and grow. That can be devastating in your spiritual life. It can be devastating in your personal life. I remember when I was first saved, I was uh, in a college and career group at the church that I attended. One of my Sunday school teachers, I remember just having a conversation and it just stuck with me uh, because I was full of questions, asking all kinds of questions. And he said, you know, I was just like that when I first got saved. But basically, and he would ask the pastor all these questions. They would have these debates, and uh, it, it went on and on. And he said, basically, I got all the answers, and he pretty much stopped growing. And not too many years after that, he ended up getting a divorce. And not that one had related to the other, but I think our maturity and our growth has to be constantly taking place. You can't get to a place in your life where you kind of plateau when you kind of just skate along till you get into eternity. God is always challenging us to grow. In order to create change in your life, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of energy. It's going to take a lot of force. And what I mean by force is focus on the change. You know, something simple as reading your Bible through from Genesis to Revelation. Some people have been saved a long time. They've never actually read the Bible or read through, not even the New Testament, much less the Old Testament. Do you know it would only take about 15 minutes a day? Uh, if you read, starting in Genesis 1-1, if you read about 15 minutes a day, you would cover the entire Bible in about a year or less. And so little steps little changes that make a huge difference in our life. And that's why Zechariah 4.10, God says, do not despise the day of small things. Everything that God does begins with a small thing and grows into a large thing. When we talk about faith, we usually talk about having faith the size of a mustard seed the smallest of all the seeds, but it grows to one of the largest plants. That faith leads to works, the things that we do. Jesus said, he who gives a cup of cold water in my name will certainly not lose his reward. So the faith leads to our actions, the things that we do. As James said, faith without works is dead. It leads to the sacrifices that we make. You remember the little boy with his basket? It was just his picnic basket of lunch for himself. He had two small fish, a couple loaves of bread. Uh, enough for him, but hardly for anybody else. Yet he gave it to Jesus. And of course, Jesus multiplied it and fed the five thousands with the little sacrifice that he gave to the Lord. Little is much when God is in it. And Jesus, of course, he recognized the widow's might, her sacrifice, her offering, her giving. And so those little things that we do by faith and obedience will have big changes in our life. This might be the biggest question you and I face in 2022. And do you know what that is? Do you want to change? Or are you just satisfied where you're at in your spiritual life, where you're at uh, physically, emotionally. We need to be asking ourselves the questions. Do I really want to change? You know, Jesus came across a layman by the pool of Bethsaida and, uh, Beth, uh, Bethsaida, and he asked him the question, do you want to get well? The man had been there for 38 years. It seems like an obvious answer, but a lot of times we get stuck in the life that we're living, we get stuck kind of in the prison 
of the things that we've done, our identity becomes around our problems or whatever it may be, and we really do not want to change. We really do not want to transform. It's easy to get stuck in the prison of doing it the way that we've always done it, thinking about it the way that we've always thought about it, understanding it the way that we've always understood it, believing it the way that we've always believed it. The uh, key to transformation, living uh, begins with the seed of God's word. Think about that. Each word in this book is like a seed. As we read that seed, it gets planted in our heart. Now, the thing about this book that's different than any other book is that the words are eternal. The thoughts of this book are eternal. And the fruit it bears will bring a harvest for eternity. Use this year to let the Spirit of God through the Holy Spirit to hide or plant His Word into your heart. It says in Psalms 119.11, Thy Word have I hid in my heart, planted in my heart, so that I might not sin against you. In Psalms 119 and 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Let me just kind of illustrate this. I've used it before, but it really uh, fits this perfectly. Uh, and I don't want to overuse the illustration, but if you get some seed and the word of God is like seed, and I got some seed here. I don't know if you can focus in on that, but um, we've got uh, some basil seed right here. Uh, and it's just little, small, little specks uh, that you can barely see. But if you take this seed and you plant it in the soil, you water it, you weed it, you fertilize it, ultimately that little seed turns into this. It still amazes me that inside of this seed is the DNA that's going to create these basil plants that are, uh, has a great fragrance, aromatic smell to it. It's great tasting, but all of that starts as a seed. And in the same way, God's word is a seed that is planted in our hearts as we read it. And then God begins to cause it to germinate, to grow in our soul. Those thoughts, those ideas of the Holy Spirit. You see, if we just keep the seeds in the packet, if we keep the Bible on the shelf, what's going to happen in a year's time? Well, the seed's going to still be in the packet. The word is still going to be on the shelf. And no real change and transformation is going to take place. But the amazing thing is, if you plant God's word into your heart you meditate on it you think about it and then you begin to act on what the lord does in your life through that word it just begins to grow it begins to blossom it begins to do what god has created it to do in your life and in your heart now the way that change happens and this is letter b breaking the old patterns create real change. Romans 12, 1 and 2 says this. It says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The seed of God's word, what does it do? It renews our mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. The key to everything in your life starts with the thoughts that you accept or reject in your mind. People will hear the gospel, hear the word of God, and immediately they're accepting it or they're rejecting it. Ah, I don't believe that. And it's like the seed that Jesus talked about in the parable of the sower where the enemy, where Satan comes and snatches that seed before it has a chance to take root in their life. So everything from God's word, we either accept it or we reject it. Conforming to the pattern of this world has application to every part of our life, physically, spiritually, emotionally. 
uh, I was thinking of uh, this old saying. It says, necessity is the mother of invention. Inventions are usually created because there's a need for it. Now, back in the day, uh, we're going back decades, uh, but back in the day when manual typewriters were the only way to uh, print and type papers and uh, for business, for school, research papers, all of those things, before the age of computers, we had manual typewriters, and there was a secretary. Her name was Betty Nesmith. And she was a secretary, but she also uh, painted on the side. She would paint murals on windows and things like that. She'd make some extra money. And uh, back then, when you typed papers, and some of you are old enough to remember the manual typewriters and typing your research papers and term papers or working in an office and typing every time you made a mistake, you had to go out there and you had to erase it. Well, she was a painter and she never erased in painting. She would just get some white paint, paint over it, and start again till she got it right. And she got this idea. You see, everybody did it the same way. There were hundreds of millions of typewriters and people all around the world typing and doing it the same way. Make a mistake, they would erase and try and fix it, and it would mess up the paper. Uh, she decided, well, what if I paint over the misspelled words, over the typos or whatever. Anyhow, she developed uh, what she called white out, and uh, that's how she used to correct it. And all of her neighbors, uh, other co-workers wanted to use it. She actually started a business, and eventually she sold that business, forget this, $47 million. Think about that. Anybody could have thought of it. Anybody could have developed the whiteout uh, that was used for decades and decades, but nobody did. Nobody thought about it. They had to think about it in different ways. And when we renew our minds, when the Holy Spirit begins to renew our minds, we begin to think about things differently. I believe that there's not a problem in your life. There's not a situation that you're feeling uh, coming against. May seem like a brick wall, may seem like a dead end, but I want to tell you that if God is in it, there is an answer. There is a solution. There is a new way of thinking about that. There is something that God can do to change everything in your life. That's why the Bible says that nothing is impossible with God. Being transformed, the Bible says, by the renewing of your mind is where real change happens. Now, if that's true, if your mind has not been renewed by the Spirit and the Word, even people who profess to believe and may actually believe in Christ still can fall into that pattern of the world's way of thinking. Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world. I heard a story of uh, uh, a lady who was in Christian ministry with her husband for years and years. Her husband died and uh, she was of retirement age. She started dating another man, but she didn't want to get married because she didn't want to lose her social security check. You see, that's the pattern of this old world. If you're a Christian, we have to be able to trust in God for everything, don't we? And you would think people who have been saved and been walking with the Lord are trusting with him. But when we fall into the pattern of this world, we start that stinking thinking of the way that the world does it, the way that the world thinks about it. You see, when you're thinking of things like that, well, I'm not going to be able to survive if I marry this man that God has brought into my life. That is just the wrong way of thinking. Christians who think like that, uh, they lose the type of thinking. The God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He can supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Yet, we get stuck thinking that I got to hold on to what I have and not trust God for him to give us. But when our minds are renewed, when they are transformed by the washing of the water of the word, change really begins to happen. Transformation is always the result. The boundaries and the borders of your mind are removed and not 
just expanded. You know, I was thinking of, of the story in the book of Matthew chapter 14. You might be familiar with this story. It's a story where Jesus was walking on the water. And let me just read a few of the scriptures. I want to pick it up in verse 25. It says, During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I, do not be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. Now think about this story. If this story wasn't in the Bible, I would not even conceived of the idea that you could actually walk on water. I mean, if this story wasn't in the Bible and I told people I believe we could walk on water because God says we can do anything, people would call that heresy. Or if this story was in the Bible and uh, Peter had not walked on the water, then the next doctrine that would come up, well, only Jesus can walk on the water because he's the son of God. But Peter actually walked on the water. Do you see the point that I'm going at? You see, we couldn't even conceive or think of the possibility of somebody being able to walk on, a wa a walk on the water unless we read about it in the scriptures. And that's the same thing in our lives. There are things that God can do, change, and transform in our lives if we just simply open ourselves up for God to renew our minds, to renew our thoughts, to renew the way that we think and uh, act on things. And of course, you know that the story does not end there. It picks up in verse 30. It says, but when Peter saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? You see, the renewing of our mind is daily. It is a lifelong process. The difference between the young Peter, who was inconsistent, you know, his name was Simon Peter. Simon meaning a, a, a reed that was waving, swaying back and forth. That's what his old life was like. And Peter, the rock, so he was always inconsistent, going from the old way of thinking to the new way in the spirit of God. So that change that was transforming his life. And that's like our lives. We need to continually renew our thoughts, renew our minds in the Lord's. That process needs to be continued. Peter I believe more than anybody believed that scripture that nothing was impossible with God. When he was an old man, he had seen it all. Probably means more to Peter than most of us because he actually walked on water. He actually saw the dead raised. He was actually on the mountain of transfiguration where Jesus was transformed before their very eyes with Moses and Elijah standing there. What was it that Peter would not believe in as his mind was renewed, as he saw and experienced these things with the Lord? And I believe that is true for us. As we walk with God, God is going to do amazing things in our lives. He's going to help us to think biblically. He's going to help us to think like God thinks and act the way that God acts. When the change and transformation begins to take place, it will ultimately leave you in charge. And that's the second thing that I want to talk about. It changes us to bring us to be in charge. The byproduct of God's changing us is that it is changing us in order to give us more responsibility, to put us in charge. And the first thing that I want to say about that is uh, being faithful with small things we talked about in change being faithful with small things leads to being in charge of bigger things and that's the parable that Jesus talked about in Matthew 25 
21. Now, I can't fully develop this point completely in this message, but let me say that was God's plan in the beginning, before the fall. That is God's plan today, right where we're at, and that will be God's plan in the future, in eternity. That has always been a part of God's plan. Before the fall, before sin, before death, before disease, pain, and suffering, God gave man in the garden, he gave him dominion over the earth to take charge, to change, to subdue the earth. We were made in God's likeness and his image to be caretakers of the earth, not just to mop and sweep the floors, but to be in charge of the store to manage it. This is what God said in Genesis 1:26. Then God said, let us make man in our image. Remember, this is before the fall in his likeness and let them rule or take dominion over the fish of the sea, over all the earth and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And how does that dominion begin it begins with small things. You know, when my kids were just learning to drive and I taught each of the kids how to drive, first thing we did was we would sit in the car, get our seat belts on, and I would tell them from the very beginning, okay, this is a steering wheel. This is uh, the dashboard. This is a seat belt. And we talked about what it was to drive a car. And I was very hands-on in instruction because in order to have the privilege of driving a car, have the liberty uh, that goes with it, there's a lot of responsibility. That car can be a lethal weapon if it's out of control. And so we took baby steps by baby steps, learning how to turn the car on, learning going into the parking lot, learning how to steer the car, learning how to maneuver it. Then we would go into our, um, uh, into our, our, our house area and our community, and we would go around the cul-de-sacs. We would drive and drive and drive till I felt sure that they had complete control over the car. Then we went on to the surface streets, and learn how to drive with other cars, red lights, stop signs, do other things, and ultimately working towards the interstate, being able to get on the interstate and be able to drive there. And finally, when I felt like they were completely ready, then we would get in the car and I would say, take me to the store, take me to church, take me wherever. And I wouldn't say a thing I'm no longer giving instructions on how to do it unless they asked me a question specifically. Then I'd be happy to answer a question. But I was getting them ready to be able to drive alone. And in the same way, that's what God is doing with us. He gives us a little responsibility. He's teaching us step by step. If we can't master the things that he's already given us, why would he give us anything more? And that's exactly what Jesus is talking about in this parable. Here, Jesus' parable of the present and future of being in charge. So we pick it up in Matthew chapter 24, excuse me, chapter 25, in verse 14. And God says this. He says, again, the kingdom of heaven will be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. Notice a couple things. This is about the kingdom of God. It's about eternity. And it's a man who's going on a journey. In most of Jesus' parables, the man who is going on the journey is Jesus himself. And so what does Jesus do before he takes this journey? The exact same thing he did with his disciples. He entrusted them with his property. He gave them things of responsibility to take charge of. To one, he gave five talents of money, to another, two talents, to another, one talent, according to his ability. Then he went on his journey. And so where did Jesus go? He went to heaven. He is there now, and he is going to come back. The man who had received the five talents went at once and put his money to work. 
you can circle that word work and gained five more. And so he had to do something with what God gave him. And so he put it to work and he doubled it. And so also the one with two talents gained two more. But the man who had received the one talent went off, dug a hole in the ground, and there he hid his master's money. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. What is Jesus talking about? Where did he go? He went to heaven. Where's Jesus now? He's up in heaven. And what's going to happen later? He is going to come back to earth. He's going to settle the accounts. There's going to be that day of reckoning. And this does not have to be a scary day for God's people, for those who've been entrusted with what God has given to them. God wants us to use it, to develop it, to grow it so he can give us more responsibility. Why? Because he ultimately wants to reward and bless his children with that which he has given to him. And so he's coming to settle the accounts. Being put in charge is a blessing and a privilege that comes with a lot of responsibility. You know, a three-month-year-old baby in diapers. You know, they're so cute, and they're so cuddly, and they're so much fun. But a 30-year-old baby in diapers, yeah, not so much. You know, you're expecting the baby to grow and to develop into the de different stages and to grow and take more responsibility. And that's the way we raise up our children and that's the way God wants to raise us up as well. And so he comes to settle the accounts. We are to mature. We're to grow, to be responsible, to help uh, our children to be everything that God has purposed them to be. Our Heavenly Father does the exact same thing. God grows us. He matures us. He allows, now get this, the trials and the tests to come so that we will change and grow. None of us like trials in our lives. None of us like setbacks in our lives. None of us likes hardships in our lives, but God allows them, why? Because he is raising us up. He is training us up to overcome those trials, to deal with them with God's spirit so that he in turn can give us more responsibility and put us in charge of greater things. And so this is what Jesus said. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts with them. The man who had received the five talents brought the other five. Master, he said, you entrusted me. That word trust is in entrusted. You have trusted me with five talents. See, I have gained five more. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. And you can circle that word, few things, and I will put you in charge of many things. What is he talking about? He's talking about the future. When Jesus comes back and he settles the accounts, he's talking about eternity. Did you get that picture? So before the fall, God put man in charge. We are supposed to be in charge of all that God entrusts us today. And he is doing that so that we could be in charge of more things into the future. Come and share in your master's happiness, Jesus said. So what are these many things that God was referring to? Now, we don't know exactly, but we do know that it's big. It's beyond what our minds can conceive. And this is what Jesus told his disciples in Matthew 19. If you go back a few verses, now these were the fishermen and the tax collectors. And this is what Jesus said to them about their future. And I think it alludes to our future. In Matthew 19, 28, it says this, Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth that at the renewal of all things, the renewal, the new heaven and the new earth. So what's going to happen at the renewal of all things? When the son of man sits on his glorious throne, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. 
And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mothers or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and many who are last will be first. So God is entrusting us. He wants us to put what he's placed inside of us together to grow so that he might bless us in the future. So I believe that the chasm of change from the few things in this life to the many things in next life is so big and so vast that the only thing that I can liken it to is the story of Joseph in the Old Testament who had been sitting in a prison cell for more than two years. And there was no prospect of a future for him, but he was faithful to God and everything that God had given to him, placed in him to do. And he was faithful in that prison cell. And eventually he was elevated to complete role and uh, rule and charge over Egypt. The prison clothes were exchanged for royal robes. A gold chain was pushed, uh, placed around his neck. A signet ring was put on his finger. He was given new sandals. The prison wasn't the final destination. It was the palace. Is it any different for God's children today? Hey, Peter tells us with confidence in 1 Peter 2.9, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. So that is the future that God has placed for us or has set for us. Every trial that we face or face now or face in the future in 2022 is an opportunity for change, real change, spiritual change to take place in our life because God is raising us up to be in charge with greater responsibility. Let me leave you with this. As you think about the changes God would have you make in 2022, exciting, rewarding, but it's going to take a lot of work. And I want you to mull over this week. God, what do you want me to do in 2022? What changes do you want me to make and to take in this year so that my life will be productive, glorifying to you? Here are the words that God gave to Joshua, who took over the leadership responsibility from Moses, the servant of God. Joshua was Moses' personal ascendant, uh, assistant for Moses for over 40 years. So jo uh, Joshua was Moses' right-hand man for 40 years. Joshua had been trained and equipped. He saw how Moses wrestled with problems of leading Israel. And so now it was his turn. Now Joshua was going to be left in charge with the greatest responsibility of his life. And so here we read in Joshua 1.9. So in review, this passage, I believe, encapsulates the law of change that God wants to do in our life. Each of these principles that I've talked about are right here in Joshua, starting in verse 1, 1 through 9. It says in Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, After the death of Moses... The servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid. Moses, my, descent, uh, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land that I'm about to give you to the Israelites. All right, he was Moses' aid for 40 years. 40 years, Joshua was faithful as Moses' aid, learning, growing, experiencing all that Moses did. You see, Zechariah 4.10, do not despise the day of small things. He had to be faithful in being the aid to Moses because one day God was going to put him in the place where Moses was. You've been faithful with a few things, Jesus said in his parable, here take on 
greater things. God is about to expand Joshua's responsibility for the greater things that God had planned for Joshua all along. And number two, in verse three, we read this. I will give you every place where you set your foot, as I promised Moses. Your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon, from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country, the great sea on the west. No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. God is going to be with Joshua. He says, I will never leave you or forsake you. As we go through the changes in life, God is with us. He's not going to leave us or forsake us. Every change, every challenge that God puts up to put us in charge, God is with us. He is working in us and through us. God is fighting with us. Amen? Do you hear that? God is with you, and he will work through you. If God is for us, who can be against us? You can't live this life on your own. You can't fight this fight on your own. The greatest change that will happen in your life is to be a born-again new creation in Christ. It all starts there, that little seed of faith, calling on God, asking him to come into your life, to take away your sins, to make you a new creation, to forgive us. And the Bible says that all who call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So if you have not asked Jesus to come into your life, that's the beginning point. That's the starting point. If you have asked Jesus to come into your life, you're a new creation, then let those uh, things that he's placed inside of you begin to grow. And thirdly, this is uh, what it says in verse 6. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn to it from the right or to the left that you may be successful wherever you go. Do not let this up oh, here we go book of the law depart from your mouth meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it then you will be prosperous and successful have i not commanded you be strong and courageous do not be terrified do not be discouraged for the lord your god will be with you wherever you go did you get that he told him Hey, in order for you to be able to make it into this land, in order for you to be able to do all the things that I put you in charge of, you need to take this book of the law and meditate on it day and night. The renewing of your mind, Romans 1 and 2. So we have to renew our minds. The renewing of your mind gives you faith. It gives you strength. It gives you power and authority over the obstacles in your life. And three times in this passage, God says, be strong and courageous. The righteous are as bold as the lion. God's spirit and his word gives us the power to change and take charge of the obstacles in our life. Meditate on this and ask God what changes you would have have him to make in you this year. All right, let's go ahead and we're going to pray and I'm going to share a few announcements. Amen. Well, Father God, Lord, I just pray that this word that we've shared about change, Lord, none of us uh, naturally want to change, but Father, you create circumstances where change comes into our lives. And Father, I pray that we would trust in you. Father, that we would renew our minds that we would be strong and courageous in you. You are the one, Father, that is, helps us to, uh, to complete that good work inside of us, as your word says, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. I pray that everybody who has tuned in today to this service, Lord, that as we would think about the changes that God would do in our life, that you would do in our hearts and our minds 
this week, dear God, Father, that we would put them into action. Lord, that we would not just put it on the shelf, but Lord, that this could be the greatest year in our lives as you begin to change, transform our hearts and our minds. Father, for those who are struggling right now, Father, I pray that you would be with them, that you would help them, that you would strengthen them. Lord, help us to think with our new minds, with our new hearts, with our new thoughts. Lord, nothing is impossible with you. And so, Lord, whatever circumstance that people find themselves in right now, Lord, I pray that you would be with them, that you would comfort them, that you would help them. Lord, help them to be strong and courageous in you because you are with us. And if you are with us, who can be against us? Lord, that you've made us more than conquerors. So, Father God, we give you thanks and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, let me go ahead and share a couple of announcements. And uh, let me go ahead and just uh, back up, rewind uh, the announcement that I shared at the beginning, how we ended up at church in the kitchen again. Uh, we had no expectation last Sunday when we dismissed that we would be back in the kitchen, but things suddenly changed. Uh, and due to a few factors, uh, it caused us to rethink today's service and next week's service. The first one being the Omicron variant, which has spiked in our community and uh, is cascading all over the country. And secondly, uh, people in our church who had absolutely no symptoms uh, last Sunday uh, started becoming symptomatic. And because of that, and as the word began to spread uh, about that, we decided to make the executive decision uh, this is different than uh, last year where we were told that we had to shut down. We voluntarily uh, shut down because we wanted to protect our people and especially those who are the most vulnerable uh, so that they would be able to remain safe. Now, fortunately, everyone that we have monitored so far has had mild colds and uh, symptoms, stuffy nose, low-grade fever, slight headache, and many of them are already on the other side of that, so we praise the Lord for that. However, there are many who are high-risk people that we want to make sure and protect, so we've taken this precaution of canceling in-person services this week and next week as well. So January 2nd, will be church in the kitchen. So if you're experiencing any of these symptoms, please consult your physician and also let me know. Uh, my number's in the chat box. So uh, let me know so that I can be praying with you, call you, anything that we can do to help you, want to be able to help you as well. And uh, finally, what do we have? I had to... Oh, here's the announcements. Okay, uh, so we're going to have Church in the Kitchen next week, same time, same bat channel, and go from there. And the uh, this week, the only meeting that we have scheduled is Wednesday prayer meeting at 10 o'clock, so that's December 29th on Zoom, and uh, we're going to wish you a happy New Year's. Also, something that we were going to promote next uh, Sunday is going to be January 2nd. It's going to be the new year. And at the beginning of every new year, we start off with 20 way, 21 days of prayer and fasting. Now, that means a lot of different things to different people. And uh, one of the books that uh, I highly recommend, it's a great book on fasting. It's from uh, Gentes Franklin or Jensen Franklin. Uh, it's a good starter book talking about uh, prayer and fasting. And there's the Daniel fast. There's a lot of ways to do it where Daniel abstained from meat, sweets, and other things. Basically, it was almost like a vegetarian type of diet. The specifics on that are not what's important. You see, what's uh, important to you is going to be important to God. What you give up to uh, to uh, get closer and draw near to God is important in his heart. So the specific details we're not as concerned about, but what we want to do is consecrate the first 21 days of the new year to God. And it's not about what you're giving up, it's what you're gaining that is going to make this fast successful. As we get closer to God, the things that we give up are so less pale in comparison to what we get back. And that's the nut 
of fasting. It's not to give something up, but it's to gain a closer presence with God. And that's why we do it. Okay, so uh, let me give a uh, shout out to everybody who is online with us today, who've jumped in, Bob and Flo. Uh, great uh, that you're with us. Danny and Natalia, so glad that you are here. Lisa Sangel, Ruth and Mike, Ron and Marilyn, Nick and Edith, Jennifer Singh, Alan, Barbara and the family, Debbie Kissel, uh, Jason Brummer, uh, Mike and uh, Candace, uh, Benny and Mary, Fran. Uh, we may have missed uh, many of you, but know that we are praying for you and grateful that you have worshiped with us today. God bless you all. Uh, have a great New Year's. We're so glad that uh, you're here with us today and pray God's blessings to be upon you. God bless you. Amen. My soul to my Savior God, to thee we sing how great thou art, O oh Lord my God. When I an awesome wonder can say Sing.